Hello, I'm delighted to be with you today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Michael Roberts and I'm the executive director of the Resnick Center for Food Law and Policy. And you've heard some great talks uh, so far on food as medicine in a sort of overarching way and presenting some really interesting concepts that I hope to build on and refine the focus a little bit more in terms of how to actually accomplish uh, governance in food is medicine. And to do this, I want to offer a historical and uh, a future perspective. So my first slide here is I wanna show off a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, the garden that I uh, use here in Pasadena, California, where the weather is always nice to garden. This is my winter garden. And I garden in a couple different places uh, in the community. And this is one of my, my gardens. Uh, I show this because uh, truly food is medicine. And, and there is medicine growing in this garden. A lot of lettuce in the winter, varieties of, of uh, peas and kale and lettuce and spinach and all sorts of herbs and good things to eat. Uh, I, I like to call this my medicine cabinet. Food as medicine presents a new vision, a new way of looking at food and food systems and food development and food production in a way that, that's exciting and, and uh, refreshing. I also wanna point out, however, that it's really an old idea, uh, just packaged differently in contemporary uh, wording and contemporary thinking. But I think it's important to recognize that it's an old idea in some ways because it helps us understand the realities that we're dealing with in terms of achieving uh, this new vision and some of the barriers that come with those realities. This uh, new vision, uh, and, and I think these are, I took detailed notes of the uh, talks that have preceded mine uh, on this panel. And, and I, I really, I, I picked up some concepts that I wanted to sort of distill and share with you as I've thought about it. First, we're, we're talking about something that's holistic. Uh, as mentioned, it's soil and health human and planet earth health. Uh, it's really about systems thinking approaches uh, with an integrated networking. Um, third, which I think is really important is it's about cooperation as opposed to competition, uh, which is really a, a pretty powerful and pretty big concept. And finally, even though it wasn't necessarily called out in the earlier presentations, I think it's important to emphasize this, this is a concept that resonates both on a local level and our local communities, as well as state, national and global level. And, and really it's an effort to move all of these levels together uh, in, uh, in, in, in a sort of connected way, at least in terms of the vision and the strategies. And I think that's really important for reasons that I hope become more apparent <clears throat> as my presentation continues. So the question that I ask myself um, after listening to these great talks and thinking about this conference and thinking about the, the, this concept of food and medicine is how do you move the concept into governance? And this is where I spend a lot of my time as an academic uh, and as a lawyer thinking about food systems approaches. Is, is how, do you, how do you take a concept and then really put it into action? When I was uh, in-house counsel for a, a company years ago before I even got into food law, uh, I remember the vice president of the company would always hand out a dollar to everybody who had a good idea. And then he would say, come back when you have a plan on how to make this good idea into something that actually works. And I'll give you a lot more money. And, and I think not that, the, not that these ideas are only worth a dollar, but, but the point is, because some these ideas are actually profound and revolutionary in many, in many respects, but the real key and the real challenge is how do you turn it into something that actually works, into something that's what I call governance because that's the space that I'm in, which is law and policy, which is a form of governance or how do you make it work in terms of execution? 
And so this is the kind, this is the, the thinking process that uh, that I've gone through in my own mind in thinking about this, and I hope that it, you can relate to it as well. <clears throat> in order to to build a case on what to do, and I'm not going to suggest I'm going to uh, exactly tell you how this is going to work. I, I, that's beyond my my ability today. But I think it's a start, and I think we have to think in those terms. And that's really about what food systems thinking is anyway. Um, but I think to start, I'd like to turn to a lesson in history to show exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with systems thinking, one has to actually understand the problem and the barriers in order to achieve the um, agreed upon goals and understanding the entrenchment of ideas that are countervailing to food as medicine is really, really critical. And so that's what I hope to do uh, in this short, very short history lesson. Now, when I say this is an old idea, I turn back to the 1930s when there was, according to Professor John Black from Harvard University, he penned in the American Economic Review in 1943, that there was an international food movement, and I put this in quotation marks, that was emerging in merging knowledge of nutrition in the 1930s. When I first read this article, it was really quite profound because I, you know, I'm sort of, I teach students who, who are thinking in terms of a modern food movement, but there are there have been multiple food movements, and it's important to remember and to reflect on the important role of nutrition in the history of food, and to realize that it's a fairly recent concept, one that really took hold in the 30s, thanks to uh, a lot of nutrition information that was developed uh, during uh, the war, uh, the, first, the first war. <clears throat> and it was in, in our ability to understand how health and nutrition tie in together uh, in terms of well-being. And so that was a, an idea that really took off. Uh, another really key person by the name of John uh, was John Boyd Orr. And he was, there's a wonderful picture of him uh, on the screen from Nourish Scotland. It was actually a fairly recent article uh, that describes uh, his philosophy as it relates to today. And John Boyd Orr was the first director general of the United Nations and uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, otherwise known as the FAO. John Boyd Orr really made, he made a number of contributions, but two of which I think are interesting to reflect on at this point is one is he linked agriculture to nutrition. Now that's what we're talking about, right? And he did this back way back when and at the time, it was a breakthrough linkage. It was a break, breakthrough way of thinking. And it caught the attention of a lot of people, including uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who in turn inv invited uh, Mr. Orr to the White House to meet with her husband, who happened to be the president, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And that conversation put into motion a number of activities. Uh, that led to the development of the, um, the, F, the FAO and other sort of world food governance discussions. <clears throat> so this was a concept that was, was, was attributed to John Boyd or this relationship between agriculture production and nutrition. A second concept that was a constant thread through his writings and presentations was the concept of cooperation. Again, another concept that relates to things that have been discussed already in this conference, as well as it relates to the food as medicine approach and to systems thinking and so on and so forth. But the idea of cooperation uh, was certainly um, a big part of that era as well because of the as we saw through the development and then the later demise of the League of Nations and then the development of the United Nations and how countries can work together in a way <clears throat> to ensure that we could eradicate hunger and deal with, uh, with malnutrition and look at food in a different way. Now, I've also included 
another person on this on this slide, but who goes by the first name of Tom, Senator Tom Harkin, instead of John. But uh, to break up the monotony here a little bit, actually, I've included his picture because of something that I think is really interesting about Senator Harkin that I wanted to call out. And uh, I brought this up with him in an interview that we conducted the other day on the, Res the UCLA Resnick Center podcast. It's the second of a series of inter uh, podcasts that we are developing. And we had the privilege of interviewing Senator Harkin. And I pointed out to him that he had done something in his career that was actually quite novel that ties into this conference in a really unique way and also relates back to John Boyd Orr, which is that Senator Harkin served on both ag and health committees in the Senate and the House. And, and he made that connection. Now, he, he did it, I think, in an instinctive sort of way, seeing the connections. And I think that's his brilliance, quite frankly, is that he's able to see connections uh, even intuitively, and that's what made him such a great legislator. So it made sense that Senator Harkin, being from the great state of Iowa, would represent agriculture, but he also represented nutrition and health. And so I think that this linkage has been around for a long time in different formations, and it is instinctive to us that food is medicine, and it's been, it's been debated and vetted and thought about in different ways in different in different formations. And I, I think that's important for us to appreciate. <clears throat> the, the talks between Franklin D. Roosevelt and Orr and others led to what's known as the Hot Springs Conference in 1943 in Virginia at a, at a hotel that bears that name. And, and this, these early talks, again, enveloped this notion of agriculture and nutrition, which, uh, resulted in the development of the FAO. Here's a picture uh, depicting an event in Quebec, Canada in 1945, when the FAO came into existence with the signature of its constitution by more than 20 nations. It is now the largest specialized agency within the United Nations and of course sits in Rome as its headquarters and works with member countries around the world and employs, I think, roughly 3,400 employees. So again, a massive sort of institutional response to this connection of agriculture and health. So when we ask the question, how do we govern? Here's an example of, of uh, an institutional response that resulted from that unique concept or that paradigm uh, changer or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> now, what's resulted from all of that? And I think this is important to, 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 to discuss, to understand, again, because when we talk about these concepts, we have to understand what we're dealing with. So uh, I, I am working on an article right now where I'm exploring the outcomes or the legal frameworks, as I put it, or the pathways of this discussion around the development of the FAO and global food development and this marriage between agriculture and nutrition. And, and these legal frameworks are not, they're not completely distinctive. There's a lot of rela inter relationships between them, which is fine, but I think it's a way to sort of think about paths that were taken and paths that were not taken. And there is some structure behind these uh, these, um, these concepts for sure. So nutrition. Uh, nutrition, uh, again, is what brought everyone together. Um, and it has been, it has its, its framework. The, within the FAO, there are uh, certain guidelines and recommendations to governments to follow in terms of nutrition labeling. But we certainly know that every country around the world has a strong nutrition legal framework in terms of labeling requirements, in terms of setting standards, uh, and in terms of setting guidance and communicating with consumers and working with industry. It is also interesting that the FAO in recent years has picked this up pretty aggressively, more so than in later years uh, through its zero hunger program, which is very much a sort of a systems oriented integrated approach to dealing with malnutrition and the effects of 
um, the modern food system, which of course are obesity and diabetes. A second legal framework is a path that wasn't taken. And I think this is a really interesting uh, point of history in food regulation. Or had recommended in order to ensure market stability that a world food board be created that would stabilize prices and help producers have some level of predictability. This was an interesting concept that really divided um, the, 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 the folks within that world at the time. The U and without getting into the details because we don't have time, but Great Britain and the US nixed it. They decided they weren't interested in it and because they were afraid that it would impede on the third pathway, which is free trade and saw trade as the vehicle, if you will, for posterity and for ensuring uh, the, the best defense against hunger. This was a path not taken. And, and Orr had argued that you could do both at the same time. You could have free trade and the World Food Board or have market stability on a, based on a, a level of cooperation between the governments, but, that, but, but the world decided not to pursue that path. And as a result, Orr actually resigned his position as director general of the FAL and very angrily went back to Scotland, uh, left uh, New York at the time and uh, was not happy about uh, the developments and, and resigned out of protest. So it's a path not taken. And it's interesting that that, that would have been a countervailing force in some interesting ways and may have modeled uh, different cooperative approaches had it been taken. The third legal framework is of course trade. And that is the dominant framework for the global world of food. Um, and and we, we have a, a, a multilateral trading system built around it, GATT, G-A-T-T. -T. We have legal in, international legal instruments such as the SPS, Sanitary, Phytosanitary Sanitary Agreement, the TBT, Technical Barrier Trade Agreement, and other legal instruments we have bilateral, we have regional trade agreements that all are consistent with these ideas of free trade reducing barriers. And this is the dominant model, the dominant framework, the dominant, and it's based on competition. It's based on market forces. And, and there's a lot of arguments about pluses and minuses and, and pros and cons about this, this framework, but here it is and it, and it works in terms of its approach to resolving a lot of legal disputes, for example, from biotechnology to beef hormones to dolphins and, uh, and animal welfare and, 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 and other issues. But, but it sets a, a, a groundwork that's really interesting. The fourth one, which is sort of a countervailing force against free trade is food security. And, and food security, of course, is more of a normative framework, but it has, I think, legal implications, particularly as we move forward. And food security is, is, is by definition, is a really interesting his history that we won't get into as well. But all of these frameworks, uh, sort of work together, oftentimes they converge where there's arguments that food security depends on free trade. Uh, there are those who argue that and those who contend that that's not the case. COVID-19 has brought a lot of, has sharpened our focus on these frameworks and has made us think about them in different ways. But I wanna take, I wanna present just five quick takeaways here uh, based on this sort of historical analysis. One is that concepts like food is medicine um, um, are powerful. And, and, and the power lies in their ability to relate to contemporary societies. And, and, and that's important, it's really important because we think in terms of medicine and it resonates with us. And so I think it, it's something that, that works with us. Secondly, it cuts against deeply entrenched interest. The reason I've taken the time to go through this framework analysis is because we have to understand that we don't just engage in competition and free trade and an industrialized agricultural approach because it just sort of comes natural to us. We did it because we made a choice. Oh, the choices made by the dominant powers at the time. 
And in, in order to, to change, we have to reckon ourselves that this is going, not going to be easy. And we have to, to, we're dealing with entrenched ways of thinking and entrenched um, models of governance and so forth. But I do think that we, we need to stay hopeful. And that's my fourth point, that, that there is a way uh, to move forward uh, and, and it can be positive and it can, we can take large steps as well as small steps. I included a picture here back to my garden with my grandson who loves to come to the garden with me. And I, he's my hope because he's really, really interested in these issues. He started an environmental club at his elementary school and he's very interested in gardening and environmental issues and is learning how to eat uh, from the garden. And so young children, youth certainly are represent hope. Um, and finally, the solutions. I think the solutions, it's really, really important that we again think of these on multiple levels from a local, a national and a global level. Uh, all of us have our own niche. We have our own path uh, and our own lane, I, I mean, and we, we ought to, we need to work together and coordinate. And, and I, I'm optimistic for the future. I think we have a lot to learn, but we need to also reckon with the past and understand uh, the challenges that lie ahead. So this is a great conference. I congratulate um, uh, the Harkin Institute and all those who are participating as we talk about these important issues. Thank you very much.